Good morning. I'd like to thank those that are viewing us by Facebook, and I hope that you saw the message last week, because this will be a part two of As a Person Thinks, or as it's quoted literally, As a Man Thinketh, in Proverbs 23, 7. The bottom line on last week's message was there's no changing that. It is an indisputable fact that the way I think in life is going to determine most of what happens in my life. That the part that I control outside, of course, God controls it all, but my reaction to it and the opportunities and the stewardship that I have is part and parcel with the way that I think. Think. Now, I can't change that, but I can change the way I think. And so we want to think biblically. And last week we talked about a certain book that uh, I happened to be reading, uh, the 10 books that screwed up the world and five others that didn't help. And we went through a couple of those names, such as uh, Machiavelli uh, with a um, philosophy that to succeed in life, I have to learn to not be good. And uh, then went on all the way from him to Rene Descartes to Thomas Hobbes and uh, Rousseau and all of these different philosophers, even up to people like Friedrich Nietzsche that determined who Hitler was going to be in a war that killed 75 million. And then Vladimir Lenin, the man that said we must, must crush resistance and everything that opposes us and, dis and destroy and remove the exploiters, talking about the middle class at all costs. And, of course, the communists have now to date killed well over 100 million people. And so what, is, what does all this say? Ideas have consequences. Thoughts have ramifications. The way that I think affects everything in life. Now, I say all that to say this. I want to make an analogy today between trees and you. Now, I'm not an arborist. I didn't even know what that word meant until I looked it up. That's a tree surgeon and a tree inspector. Now, why is this important to me? Well, Friday afternoon... I was coming out the driveway after a terrible rainstorm and windstorm Friday afternoon, and two huge trees were down across my fence and across the driveway, which prohibited me from getting out of my house. Well, interestingly enough, a year ago, a tree that had a trunk of about a seven-foot diameter, and I took pictures of it. It was, I think we even put it on Facebook or whatever. You could stand in the middle of the trunk. But inside the middle of it was totally rotten. And this huge tree that looked totally healthy from the outside had rotted from the middle and had fallen across my driveway last year. And half of that tree that is so big is still there. And so I'm asking God, what is it about me and trees? And uh, why have I got to do this again? So I'm becoming way too familiar with a chainsaw. But I want to make an analogy with that. And then I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 because that's where this is all leading. And I want you to understand this because to me this is very, very important. It will determine who you are and what you become. And we're going to talk about trees for a minute here in just a second. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Our weapons are spiritual, of course. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, into, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience with when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, I want to bring out that scripture, and I want to do that through the analogy of trees. So, I started studying 
here for the last couple of days about trees, and this is what I want you to understand. Rot in a tree is caused by the action of three different perpetrators. Number one, bacteria. Number two, it could be fungi. Number three, it could be insects. Now, Webster's Dictionary in the 1928 division, uh, edition says that rot is decay, not firm, unsound, and you would never find this in a current edition of Webster's, but it says deceitful, ill-smelling, and several different other metaphors for it. And then we find the Hebrew definition, to dry up. To decay by spreading disease. Weakness to wither away. That's what rot means. Now, where is that? That word's used several different times in the Bible. I'm not going to go through all of those, obviously. But I want to give you just a couple where it's translated literally with the word. In Proverbs 12, here in verse 4, he says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. Rottenness in his bones. Now, we're going to talk to you about that in just a second. Just hold that. Flip over to Proverbs 14, 30, and you'll see what it says. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Could be translated, but passion, but lust is rottenness to the bones. Now, let's talk about those two verses for just a minute. It says, the wife is a crown to her husband, but she who causes shame is rottenness to his bones. If you look at the interpretation of that, you'll find out that in a situation in which there's no resolve and no peace, but endless conflict or shame that lasts, it finally gets into the inside of a person. Proverbs 14, 30. What is envy, this passion to have something? It's a constant razor in the brain. It's a burr under the saddle. It's the rock in my shoe. It's the constant thing that I see every day in life. No matter what I see, it reminds me of this thing that I want that I don't have. So, if I have that, then I am a candidate for rottenness in the bones. Now, I want to talk to you about the definition of these things because I think it has, you know, we learn, Solomon learned from nature. But I want you to hear that. I, I was fascinated with this. Bacteria, if you look it up and, de and define it, are cells without nucleuses. A nuclei, or nucleus, are organelles. Now, what is an organelle? An organelle is the controls or the workings inside of a cell. What do they do? They generate energy, and they control the reproductive part of the cell. So, when you have bacteria, you have less power, and you have no growth in certain cells that are attacking the body. Now, it is also, bacteria means that these cells have no um, nucleus in them. I gave you the definition of organelle, but no nucleus in them. And what does the nucleus do? The nucleus is the one that transports the cell's DNA molecules to where they need to be inside the cell and to do the work they need to do to other cells. So it's the brain within the cell. But if I don't have a nucleus, what do I have within the cell? I have no organization. I have chaos within the cell. So that's bacteria, fungi. It's a complex cell. It's like the cell of an animal or plant. And here's what it does. It's like a cancer. It absorbs the plant or animal matter continuously until the host victim is consumed. It comes from the Greek word sponge. That makes sense, right? A sponge absorbs that which it comes in contact with. That's what fungus does. 
And then you have insects. There's 22 different kinds of insects that destroy trees. I'm going to give you the example of one, a gypsy moth. A gypsy moth consumes the leaves that, that, that take in light. Now, why is that important? Because without the leaf, there can't be the absorption of light, which is necessary for photosynthesis, which is the process through which light carbon dioxide, and water takes these elements and turns them into oxygen. It is the part of a plant that makes it healthy. So without that green pigment in a leaf, that healthy pigment there, and that healthy green, uh, beautiful green in a leaf, then there is no life and it will die because it doesn't have the ability to do what it was intended to do. That's the invasion from an insect now obviously light is what the word of god now finally oh uh, well i could talk about uh different insects that would de destroy but let me just give you something i thought was kind of fascinating um we're talking about them an insect just one particular kind you think well you know an insect is kind of minor well not really fleas from rats killed 25 million people in Europe. Uh, a mosquito it carries malaria. One child dies every 40 seconds today from a mosquito bite that carries malaria. Ticks kill with the Lyme disease and other things. So th there's many different things that are dangerous to trees out there, but I want to make some analogies of that as we work through this, and I want to bring you to a conclusion. Now, as you're working through this, I want you to be thinking about this. I want you to be thinking about how this rot could possibly get inside of me. How could I not be taking in light? How could I be oblivious to bacteria in my life? How could I be oblivious to fungus that's consuming me in life? How could I be oblivious to insects that are stinging me and that I'm allowing to do their damage in my body or in my mind that controls my life? How could that possibly be? Well, I want to move you forward as we get towards the answer to this. But I want to give you something just quickly. When I rationalize away known contradiction to the Word of God, I'm in the process of moving toward accepting some kind of rot in my life. Now think about this. There's no greater illustration in this. There, all through Scripture it gives this. But I think this is beautiful the way it talks about rot. God tells me something and I say, okay, God, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to do that. I'm not saying no, but I'm just saying not yet. Time goes by, time goes by, time goes by. And I justify, I rationalize. Well, circumstances are not such that I should obey that right now. And culture tells me that that's pretty oddballish for me to have to do that, God. And, um, you know, there's a lot of circumstances that, God, maybe you just don't understand and all these things because your word's pretty harsh for me to obey all of this kind of stuff. And it's, it's pretty unbelievable. You know, pretty soon you've accepted a little bit of the de dehabilitating effect of rot in your life. Rot is that which comes into the Christian's life when I accept untruth as a permissible way of life and I know that that's not God's best for me. It may start out a little, well, somebody says, you ought to forgive that person. I know, but I just can't. I can't forgive that person. They're not saying they can't forgive them. They're saying they won't forgive them. And what happens as time goes by, as time goes by, it stays there, it stays there. But you see, it's analogous to all of these things. It doesn't just stop, it grows. They don't even recognize it. And pretty soon, it's taken over large parts of my life. And I've missed so much that God wanted me to have. Western civilization, if you are anywhere 
aware of history is rotting before our eyes. You may say we're getting freer, we're getting emancipated, we're getting to be everything that we should be, and all of these authors that say there is no evil except in saying no to anybody about anything. Well, the consequences are chaos. Isn't it interesting? That's analogy right here. When you destroy the DNA uh, nucleus center, the consequences are a different society. Fornication. Sex before marriage used to be a sin. It's no longer considered a sin. It's a way of life. You know, I mean, uh, used to be it was frowned on if you lived together before you're getting married. That's just through. I just remember I was just having lunch, uh, dinner the other day, and I was just I was just listening to this lady, and she was just saying, you know, she said, well, they're they're together, but I know they're living together, but he's not, he's not really with her. And, you know, he was living with this other person or whatever this kind of thing, and and it was just so happenstance as I was just listening to this, and and I, I realized that it, it's our culture. And if you say anything about homosexuality or anything that the Bible says anything about it, you're a homophobe and uh, you're a bigot and you're all these kind of things. But we forget about the fact that the Bible says clearly that it's not a permissible lifestyle. In fact, it says an abomination before God. And uh, if you, in the Bible, it said it's a uh, disgrace for a man to dress like a woman. Now we change sex. But all of these things are to be accepted in our culture and accepted in our society. And we don't even see the rot that is happening to us. We're so much weaker than we ever were before. As a society. But societies are made up of what? People. Individuals. And you say, well, that's society, and that's the politics, and that's the politicians, and I don't get involved with any of that thing. I just watch Fox News and go about my business. <laughs> Shame on you, because we are society. We are the United States of America. We are the citizens. We are the potential effectives of where we are and what, what, what we're doing. We can pray without ceasing. We can be burdened. We can be very sensitive to the rot that is about us or we can rationalize and say well that's not us I'm still going to get my paycheck and I go about my life now well <laughs> that's kind of like cutting off the tree that you're sitting on but we'll get to that in just a minute now what are the signs of tree rot and I'm this is interesting leaves are wilting leaves are wilting and tree growth is stunted. It's not growing like it was. The limbs break off easily. Now, let me make some analogies here. What happens in my life when my leaves are wilting? My ability to take in light, uh, my ability to show that I'm a healthy tree. What happens when my leaves are wilting? You know what happens then? You've lost your hope. You've lost your vitality in life to believe that God is all-powerful, that he can do anything at any time, anywhere he so desires, and you still believe the Bible is the Word of God. Or you can just kind of wilt. You can just kind of think, well, you know what? Things are... Culture's changing, and you know, I can still have my fun. I can still sing my songs. I can still sing my praise songs, and I can still go out and work my job, and I can still make my money, and we don't even see what's taking place to us and society at large. Now, God never said this is a hospitable environment. He did say there was bacteria, fungi, and insects. He said, beware, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good courage, I've overcome the world. Paul, we're going to kill you. That's all right, to live as Christ, to die as gain. He, didn't, he never had it easy, and he did more for God than anybody's ever lived. And so I think we've kind of forgotten that most of the things that are injected into our thinking are probably not biblical if they're coming from out there in the culture world because we have to sift through that, correct? Well, that's leaves are wilting. What about the tree growth stunted? Let me ask you something. Are you as in love with God as you were the first year you got saved? Can you even remember back that far? 
Can you remember, I mean to tell you, I remember back then, and I remember handing out tracks to every single thing that moved, and I went into that Georgia State parking lot, and I remember that guy there at that pay booth, and he said, don't give me another tract. I've already got a, I've already got a whole fistful of them. I don't need any more. Are we as in love with him as we were back then? Are his time and circumstances and aging and problems and all of those conf confronting challenges of life caused us to kind of say, well, I don't really think about him like I used to. Tree growth, stunted. If we're not growing as Christians, we're going backwards as Christians. Number three, the leaves break, the limbs break off easily. You show me somebody that's easily offended, and I'll show you somebody that got hurt way back here, either by a church or an individual or a marriage partner or a friend or in some way they were betrayed or whatever else, and it never healed, and the rot stayed there, and it grew and grew. And so now when somebody says something, they fly off the handle. They get, they get upset easily in life, and the limbs break off easily because this rot was never dealt with back there. That's what happens. How many times people just, they, 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 they do this, and, and I want to say to them, can I ask you a personal question? Because, where was it I was just at, and this person was just, oh, it was, oh, I was, uh, it was about a water bill. And I'm not going to say the town this was in, but uh, the lady was just going crazy on me. And I said, well, it's a mistake in the water bill. I mean, it's $160, I don't know. And she just said, well, I can tell you this, you're not going to get out of it. I thought, we haven't even gotten that far. I'm not going to get out of it. We haven't even discussed how I got into it. <laughs> it was incredible. But you know what? I wanted to halt and say, time out. What man, probably, or what circumstances hurt you that have gotten this turtle shell up against me before we've ever even really gotten into it? Where in your past did this rot set in of this unforgiveness or this, other, this having this hard heart against something or that somebody was not going to push you around or somebody's not going to take advantage of you or all these things? Where did that happen to you? You see, rot is very subtle. It comes in in ways that we never thought. Limbs that break off easily. You know what? We've only got one job in life, right? Please God. You know, if you really focus on what Jesus focused on, what did he say to him? Thou art, at the baptism, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Paul said, my life is to please him. I have to please a person. I don't have to please the committee. I don't have to please this over here. I don't have to please that person over there. I have to do what God has called me to do. I have to please him. That's all you have to do in life. Now, other people may react to that, but that's all you have to do. Let me move on. Ways to avoid tree rot. Number one, pull away excess material from the roots that are holding water. Water causes rot. If you've got a bunch of mulch and a bunch of pine straw and all of this dirt around your tree, you're probably adding to the, uh, the limit of what your tree can be, and you're probably accelerating the, ex the expiration of your tree. But how do we make an analogy with that? Pull away excess material that is holding water. What is it in my life that I'm dragging? Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind me and pressing towards the mark. What is it that I'm dragging and pulling that's keeping me back from being all that I can be for God? What is it? Number two. <laughs> I could not believe this when I saw this and studied this. Did you know that bacteria, fungus, and insects go for the tree that is the most stressed first? <laughs> I couldn't believe that. How in the world does an insect know what tree is stressed? 
<laughs> she's freaking him out about bills he's got to pay or way he's got to shake or whatever. I mean, how do they know that? But they do. They go after the weakest trees, stressed trees. How does a tree get stressed? It's too close to other trees. It needs space. It needs light. It needs water. All of these different things. And it goes after stressed trees. Now, what is stress? Let's make the analogy. Stress for me is anxiety about things that I don't give to God. What I keep thinking about and what keeps rotating in my mind about what is causing me to be a little bit anxious about what the outcome's going to be and who's going to do what and what's going to happen and where we're going to be and all those kind of things. I mean, people said to me, so what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I know who does, and that's good enough. You see, stress. <laughs> I cannot tell you how bad that is for the body. I mean, it is a killer in every single way. It, uh, from blood pressure to everything else there is, stress is a terrible thing for the body. How do we get rid of that stress? What do we do about that stress? You know what Jesus said? He said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Notice he said, my peace, not your peace. Um, not as the world give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, your response would probably be, well, you know what, that was Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Uh, he didn't have to be stressed out about too much because he knew he was God and he had all power and he didn't have to worry about what was going to happen and all those kind of things. And, okay, well, I want to, okay, you hold that. And I want to read John chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. And you tell me that Jesus didn't have to worry about something. He says here, he says, <clears throat> he who hates his life will lose it and he who he who lo um, excuse me, he who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Listen to this in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Wow. That was before he said that about John 14. Does that mean Jesus was anxious over here and he was peaceful over there? No. Nothing psychotic about him. Nothing this way, that way, or whatever. No. Jesus was consistent all the way. But what was his secret? What was the secret to that? Well, the secret to that was that Jesus didn't find his peace in circumstances. Jesus didn't find his peace in people. Remember, they started uh, giving him accolades one time and all that kind of stuff. Jesus didn't accept that because he knew what was in the heart of man. Most people, they live to be treated great by man. They want to be popular. They want to be famous. They need that for their sense of self-acceptance. Jesus didn't need that. He didn't need that, and he gives you what he doesn't need. He gives you his sense of self-acceptance, accepted in the Father, accepted in the Beloved, just like Jesus Christ is. We don't have to have that from people because we've got that from somebody much better than people. We've got it from God Almighty, acceptance. He knew he had his Father's approval. He didn't have to get it from man. God loved him hook, line, and sinker, and he knew it. And can I tell you something? God loves you hook, line, and sinker, and you don't have to ever worry about that changing. God loves you. You know, if one of my children was hurt or, or needing me, I don't waste much time in getting to them. 
I mean, I'm pretty sensitive to that. A mother was sensitive to that. A mother hears a child cry, and she knows the difference between a hurt cry and it's uh, just a baby cry, and I'm not getting my way cry, and I'm really in danger cry. Like a mother bear coming after her cubs, God comes after us. So I don't have to worry about people, possessions, circumstances. What did Jesus say? A man's life consists not in the things that he possesses. What does it consist in then? It consists in his relationship with God. What he does for God. Now, so with all of that being said, well, let me go real quick. Diminish the stress in your life. Prune away dead branches. Somebody says, well, I'm in a relationship, and they want me to do this, and they want me to do that, and I know it's not right, but, uh, you know, I just don't, I I can't live without them. I don't want to break away from this thing and all this kind of stuff, and uh, you need to prune away the dead branches. Number four, regular investigation of leaves, trunk, and roots. I didn't know this, but did you know a tree gets most of its water by the smallest roots on the surface? Not the big roots, but all of those millions of little bitty baby roots right there on the ground level where it gets most of its water. I thought, you know what? God spoke to me with that. Stacy, it's not mostly in seminary. It's not mostly at the big conferences or the seminars or things that you've been to in life. It is through the daily listening to me. It's the daily time with me. It's the little bitty things when you're at the grocery store and I spoke to you about something. Or you're reading the word of God and he says something to you, revealing something through his word of God. There, you get it. Now, those little things, fine. Excuse me, five. The rapid response to detect rot and disease. If I let it linger, it spreads. I have to remove it. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm talking about all alien thinking to what God says he wants from me and to what he's revealed in Scripture. Now, this is a very powerful passage because if you look at it and you, and you see this thing What's behind it in the Greek? I want to read it for you again, and I want to give you some interpretation of it. For though we walk in the flesh, we walk just like we're walking right now, fleshy, fleshy. We do not war against the flesh. I'm never in a fight with a person. I'm never really arguing with a person. I'm arguing with somebody's way of thinking. With somebody's way of, you know, yeah, they're doing this to me or whatever physically, but... A a thought preceded that. A way of thinking preceded that. A way of government preceded the the, the communism that put all the people in Siberia and justified all of that stuff. Thinking goes before the actions. He says, for we do not war against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not fighting with physical fist. But mighty in God... For pulling down citadels, towers, the devil is trying to build in your life. And he usually builds that over something legitimate in your life, someplace you've been hurt, something you didn't get, something you didn't want, or something that you didn't want that happened to you, all these things. And when he could possibly squeeze in a little Eve statement, says, God's holding out on you. God's not as good to you as you think he is. He's not the God that you really thought he was. He says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It means to react immediately to it. Bringing every thought into captivity. It means all thoughts that are alien to what God wants from me, I'm going to put them in prison immediately. I'm going to lock them up. I'm going to throw away the key. I'm going to keep those bad boys locked up, incarcerated away from me. I'm not going to let them be my walking around companions, 
telling me that's what I need to do and tempting me to do this or tempting me to do that. The minute it comes on you, lock that guy up. Put him away. He says, bringing every thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I don't have to think about whether the Bible teaches me that's right or that's wrong or is the Bible true or whatever. Uh, th that thing is settled long, long ago. He's like, what do you mean? I don't wear, care what anybody comes up with in Time Magazine or anything else, and they try to say, well, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were bogus, and so we don't even know if the Bible was true and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable what you read almost continuously. You know what? If you study literature and if you study ancient documents, you can determine the authenticity, the, the verifiability, the truthfulness, the veracity of Scripture is cannot be debunked. It cannot be debated. It is true all day long if you say that Homer wrote the Iliad or you say Shakespeare wrote the plays or if you say any of those guys because the same rules that say those guys wrote it are the same rules we use to choose that the Bible was written by who it was said it was written. But it's much more proof than that. Jesus invaded history God became man and he lived and he made a way for man to know how to think and a way for man to live and he destroyed all those enemies on the cross. Yes, they're not, all of that destructive uh, destruction is not yet taking place as Hebrews says, but he says we don't see all of these things in subjection, but we see Jesus. It's happening before our eyes and we know that in, on the cross they were conquered and they can be conquered in my life because of the cross that he has spoiled principalities he's disarmed principalities he's disgraced principalities he's talking about demon powers he has shown that they're not anywhere close to as powerful as God he has totally destroyed their power and guess what he's given all that victory to me now I can take that for truth and know that's truth and I can apply that to this text and say I am free based upon what Jesus did for me. I do not have to be subject to these things. So I accept the victory of Almighty God. I know that I'm more than a conqueror in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, not in Stacy, but in Christ. And when I do that, I'm in the process of bringing all these thoughts into captivity. And being ready to punish disobedience. You know what that means? And being ready to punish disobedience with your object, obedience is fulfilled. The, the, those words being ready there, they mean standing at the starting block. I was on the swimming team, so I know what it's like to wait for that gun. I'm waiting for that gun to fire because I am going to jump off as fast as I can. It's amazing what David Phelps does. When he jumps off, the length of his body and the size of his feet and all the rest of it, by the time he comes up, he is a link, I mean, uh, he's a body link uh, ahead of the other guys. But have you ever watched him? He does not dally when that gun fires. He is gone in the flash of a second. He has tuned himself to listen and not be shocked, but to move when that gun goes off. This is what, exactly what this, word, this passage is saying. When that thought comes in your mind that is alien to the Word of God, you, in a second you lock it up. In a second, you don't dally with it. You don't let the rot come in. You don't let it spread. You don't justify. You don't procrastinate. You don't rationalize. You lock it up. That's the way you handle it. You deal with it immediately. I want to read you a passage, and I'm going to close. Time's gone, but I want you to listen to this, Isaiah 5, 24. He's talking about the people of Judah that have totally disregarded God. 
In verse 20, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Those that are wise in their own eyes. He says, mighty in drinking wine, woe to my valiant for mixing and toxicating drink, woe justify the wicked for a bribe who take justice from the righteous man. Look at, listen to what he says in verse 24. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have what? Rejected the law of the Lord of host and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled, and the carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. You can't ignore God and not have consequences. Society can't call God evil, good, and darkness, light, without there being consequences? Well, you're going to have to decide. What am I going to think in life? I'm going to think what the Bible says, or I'm going to think what man says. Close with this one verse, Psalm 16, 8. As I study, I try to determine what the real life was. Of Jesus Christ. And of course it's the life that he lived here. And I say that respectfully. But what was the secret to his power? He was full man. 100% man. Psalm 16.8 says it. He says I have set the Lord always before me. Now if you thought Jesus was right there physically in front of you. Would you be thinking the things you think? And would you be doing the things you do? He said, I have set the Lord Jehovah, God, always before me. Yahweh. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. You know what that means? Internally, he's always before me, controlling what I think. Externally, he's at my right hand, nothing's going to get to me. Unless God allows it. I'm covered with what I think and what approaches me. Therefore, I'm covered. I know I shall not be. There's a sign over there on um, LaGrange Street, or it's either Gordon or the Unity Church, that says, I shall not be moved, or we will not be moved because of the tornado. When I see that, I think about this. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. How are you going to move God? How are you going to get some power strong enough to get God out of in between you and them? You can't do it. He stands like a rock. One foot, the Bible says, from sea to sea. He stretches out like a colossus. He is protecting you with his very shadow. Nothing can get to you. Why would I think things that are contrary to what God says? You know, there's an example. I didn't read it. I've got it written down here. I'm not going to read it. But you know the story. Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. And he healed Naaman of leprosy. And Naaman said, you, you, your God can do anything. Let me give you these riches. Let me give you these gifts. And Elisha said, I'll not take one single thing from you. And what happened? Gehazi secretly ran to him and said, um, the master's changed his mind. Uh, we'll take some garments and what have you. And he took them for himself. I think it was seven sets. He showed back up. God revealed to Elisha what he'd done. He said, what'd you do, Gehazi? Gehazi? Oh, no, I didn't do anything. He said, what about those garments? What about that stuff? He said, now the leprosy that Naaman had will be on you. And he turned white as snow. 
Now, when did Gehazi go bad? Right then? No. Gehazi had been harboring that greed, that lust, that desire, that unsettledness for a long, long time. And then he got his opportunity and he took it. And it cost him. You know, we read those two verses out of Proverbs. And in the, in the Hebrew, there in Proverbs in 14 and, and some others, it says, a sound heart is life to the body. You know what that word in Hebrew means? It means soothe. It almost means to sing to a child as they sleep. You ever heard that from your mother? Go to sleep, go to sleep. My mother used to, uh, she's not here today, so I can talk about her, but she used to put, she used to pretend she was the Sandman. And she said, I'm going to put sand in your eyes. And we'd be just almost so tired, and you know, and she'd say, okay, I'm putting sand in there now. It's magic. You're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. And I can still hear those words, go to sleep, and then I'd wake up the next morning. You know, that's what he's saying here. He's saying you can have this rottenness or you can have life. You can have the soothing effect of the word of God telling you it's okay. I'm here watching you right now. I've got you. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to accept rot into your body into your thinking, and take over your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you give us in Scripture the keys to life. Let us not waste them. Let us not discard them as trivial and say in some way, you know, it, you know I've heard those things before. I'll go on just like tomorrow and I'll go back to work or whatever. God, would you allow us to respond immediately to you? And Father, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for hearing the message today. If you want to know more about Orchard Hills Church, I pray you'll go to Orchard Hills Church at orchardhillschurch.com. If there's any way we can minister to you on a greater level, please contact us. If you want more information about this message, other messages, or how we can minister to you, please contact us. May God bless you, and you have a great day.